but first of all, I'd like to uh, like to let everybody know I'm joined today for your question by soon to be five time Olympian, Order of Australia medal winner, motivational speaker, businessman, and author. What hasn't he done? Matthew Levy, thank you for joining us. Thank, uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be part of the uh, the webinar today, and uh, yeah, it's great to be able to have a chat. Perfect. So just so you know, uh, if you are interested in asking questions for Matt, this is a uh, interactive, interactive section. So if we send through questions, I can then read them um, to Matt. You can do that by either hitting Alt H and asking the question, or you can leave it in the Zoom chat box if you are utilizing a mouse, uh, or you can send your emails through to webinar at visionaustralia.org. At any point during the webinar, we will be checking questions that I can ask Matt. But I think I, I think I want to ask by saying, uh, can we start by talking a little bit about the book you've written, uh, keeping your head above water, uh, inspir inspirational insights from a champion? For those who haven't read it yet, it's coming soon to Vision Australia Library, uh, very soon. But what can you tell us a little? What can you tell us about the book? So I just had to had um, a mower outside my room. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, the book um, I was I wrote it for about mm, maybe two two three years, and it's really about I guess my journey and my understanding of what success <clears throat> means to me, and um, I guess it really kind of explains uh, my success template and kind of how I've achieved what I've achieved in, in my life, and um, gives I guess some great hints and tips um, to really kind of uh, get people to kind of understand where I've come from and, and what I've kind of, uh, not so much, I guess, what I've done, but more about, I guess, how I've got there and kind of the tools that I've been able to use to get uh, to that end, um, that end, end state. And uh, yeah, it's, um, I guess, not really a bio, uh, biography um, as such, but um, it kind of uh, touches on my my life uh, to date um, and um, I guess kind of weaves in uh, a few short stories and that kind of thing uh, in, in around 270 odd pages. <laughs> yes, well, I, look, I've read it twice. It, that's uh, common knowledge. <laughs> it's really, really great. Um, just a quick question. What I find, I think, more interesting than what I've read regarding other uh, motivational speakers is that Yes, you do obviously give people a bit of a background of your journey, but um, you really do, uh, you don't heavily promote your own experience as a one size fits all. Um, you speak a lot about your challenges, but you make the book so the method is kind of individualized to anybody that has different challenges of their own. Uh, this is not something we sort of see too much from motivational well motivational speakers in my opinion um what can you tell us a little bit about the process that you took um being low vision and writing a book uh yeah for me i guess i kind of used uh uh speech to text um so i i would if i had a thought um i guess going to training or or going to to work or, or even at work um i'd um i guess get out my phone and, and just record um the audio um, and uh, I guess I'd use that process more than not. Um, and uh, I guess with technology these days, um, it's, it's great because um, things can be transcribed uh, and um, put into words pretty easily. Um, so I guess that was kind of a process that I kind of used pretty frequently when I was writing the book. Uh, I guess I kind of knew the broad, the uh, basic outline, I guess, of what I wanted to do. Um, so I guess I wrote that stuff down. Um, in a Word document, but um, most of the stuff that I uh, actually wrote in the book were, was transcribed from, from audio, uh, which I guess from an editing point of view made it difficult. <laughs> but um, I guess it was the easiest way for me to, I guess, write the book and to kind of get my thoughts down and I guess get people to understand what I, what the message I kind of wanted to, to convey. And uh, yeah, it, it still took a long time, but um, I guess it, it made it a lot easier to do it that way from a vision perspective and and uh and also a time perspective too makes sense so um for those who are unfamiliar with your story you're on your your way to your fifth olympics so that's 20 odd years in professional sport 
Um, I do have, which is just remarkable for any athlete. Um, it's certainly a longevity that isn't all that common amongst Olympians for them to stay at the top of that game for as long as you have. Uh, the question I've got from Andrew is anybody looking to get classified for a sport when they're legally blind, what, what's the process that somebody would go about doing that in your experience? Yeah, I guess um, <clears throat> from my experience, it's, yeah, first, uh, I guess about contacting your local uh, state body. Um, I guess we're all run, um, uh, sport in, in Australia is all run by, by the states and um, they, I guess, have processes in place to be able to get people <clears throat> classified uh, in the Paralympic Games or start to get classified and, I guess, go through that kind of process um, from a... Um, uh, um, from a, um, a lower level perspective and um, from there, I guess, once you kind of get get good at the sport and I guess get uh, um, more experience, um, then I guess you get classified from a national perspective um, and then I, I get from there, um, international perspective as well. And they're all, um, I guess, slightly different processes for different sports. Um, but um, from, from my uh, experience, um, yeah, it started from the state level and it kind of went to national and, and international from there. And uh, yeah, it's um, a pretty well well understood and well documented process. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of knowing where to go because um, I guess different sports have different kind of ways of uh, doing things and, and I guess avenues to, to go down. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely all starts from, from my experience, it all starts with the state. Um, and then kind of moves on from there. So, um, Matt, for those who are not familiar with your story or your journey, um, how did you, you obviously had a very rocky <laughs> start to life um, and that was the cause of your low vision. You want to give people some insight into your own journey? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I was born uh, in 1987. Uh, I was born uh about t- born at 25 weeks, uh, so around three and a half, four months uh, prem- premature. Um, and um, yeah, I guess my, my vision was, I guess, caused by uh, a bleed on the brain in the first um, three, four days of life. Um, and uh, I guess the, the big cause of the vision was um, uh, they put me on oxygen um, early on, and I guess that caused a bit of damage to the retina. Um, and uh, I've um, also got cerebral palsy, um, which is a neurological condition as well. Um, so I guess on top of uh, having, I guess, a uh, sensory condition, um, which I guess in turn has um, issues with balance and issues with uh, um, seeing things, um, I guess having a neurological condition on top of that um, definitely has its challenges in, in, in the water um, from a also from a from a vision perspective, but also from from a, a sensory and tactile function um, as well. Um, but um, yeah, I guess uh, I've had around fifty odd operations to date. Um, most of it on um, on my brain because um, I'm I'm shunted. I've got I had a shunt since I was uh, probably um, ten days old or so, um, and. Uh, um, early on, I had a few a few heart operations and lung operations um, as a result of being premi. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess I've been able to, I guess, manage what I've got um, to the best of my ability. And I guess, yeah, I've done a bit of success in, in sport, but I think it's through the, um, the values and I guess beliefs that my parents instilled in me in early age um, that have, I guess, been able to help me uh, succeed in what I've been able to do and um, I guess I've been taught from a very early age to uh, not uh, one not take opportunities for granted but also to to um, I guess find your own way in what you what you do in in life because I think um, we all get I guess told what to do a certain way but it's really about up to us um, to find uh, um, how best to to do that particular thing or that particular activity and um, I guess that's kind of what I've tried to do in in my life. Um, yeah, I guess I've tried. Um, I guess I've had advice from people and had um, uh, uh, understanding from people to 
to guide me in certain directions. But I guess at the end of the day, it's been myself that's been able to, uh, one, take that advice, but also mold that into something that I've been able to uh, understand and been able to comprehend my, myself. So, um, yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, I didn't have the best start, but I guess I've made the most of it by, um, I guess, taking the skills that I've learned early on um, to continue to enhance what I've been able to do today. Yeah, well, it, it's, yeah, it's a very uh, incredible sort of um, story that you do tell in the first couple of your chapters of your book. Um, I guess the question that, uh, that I've been asking, well, that I've been getting asked as well here, you're a very busy man. So obviously the, the sport is uh, at the forefront um, and you got into sport at a rather young age, but apart from the swimming and training, I've, I've seen, I've seen your daily sort of spreadsheet of things that you get done each day. What's some of the things that you enjoy doing as well, other than the sport? What are you working towards in the background? Um, yeah, I guess I kind of have a full-time job uh, in a bank. Um, so I'm, I do um, a bit of project management, um, change management stuff uh, in during the day. And um, that definitely keeps me busy um, aside from sport. Um, but I guess I, when COVID isn't around. Um, I guess I like to travel. Um, I like most sports. Um, I like to watch most sports um, or, or listen to most sports. So um, it's um, that's, I guess, a big part of what I do, um, whether it's watching podcasts or watching uh, or listening to, to replays of, of um, sport that happened that previous day. Um, but I guess from my perspective, I just like to, I guess, learn from different people and, and learn, I guess, how different things work. Um, because I think at the end of the day, if we're not continuing to learn, um, it makes it very difficult to, I guess, continue to move forward. And um, whether it's listening to a podcast or whether it's um, listening to someone speak or or um, listen to how someone presents in a meeting, um, I kind of like doing that kind of thing and, and like understanding how people uh, convey different messages and that kind of thing as well. And, um, yeah, I guess I don't have much time for much hobbies, but um, I guess um, they're probably the main things, I guess, that I kind of do on a daily basis apart from work and work and training. Yes. Well, uh, it's, uh, I understand you're also studying an MBA as well of business. Um, uh, yes. I finished that in September last year. Um, yeah. But um, yes, yeah, so I have a lot of free, more free time than I had back then, which is good. <laughs> Um, so one of the things I sort of picked up um, in the book and, and from some of the discussions you've had with other people, um, you're quite renowned for sort of goal setting. Um, so you've worked, you know, for 10 plus years as a change analyst at Westpac, um, which is obviously a large bank. Uh, how do you think goal setting um, has been affected by this sort of ever-changing environment we have at the moment? Yeah, I think it, definitely is tough um i guess people's way of life and the way of thinking has changed um but i guess that doesn't mean your goals have to change they might, might pivot uh slightly um but um uh, it's yeah really about i guess looking at what your goal is whether it's i don't know to do ten thousand steps per day um yes we're in lockdown in sydney um but um, that doesn't mean you can't do 10,000 steps per day. It's a matter of being, I guess, creative and really kind of working out innovative ways to continue to work towards that goal. Because I guess at one stage you really wanted to do that goal and you were passionate for doing that goal. Um, we just had an um, a change in, I guess, circumstances um, that led to it being a little bit more difficult. And um, for me, I guess, in my sport um, and also in life, um, I kind of, break my goals down into smaller bite-sized chunks. So, um, for example, if you wanted to do 10,000 steps per day, you're not going to, um, you're not going to continually look at your Fitbit or your gamut and, um, watch the steps tick over. It's really about, I guess, well, working out, well, I can do these amount of steps this hour, um, and have a bit of a break and then continue to do more steps later. Um, and so just breaking it down into, manageable um and uh i just 
um, chunks that you can kind of understand. And um, for me, I guess I had a goal, had a goal five years ago to make the Paralympic Games. Um, I didn't just wake up five weeks before trials and decide I want to do um, go to the Paralympic Games in in Tokyo. It was really about kind of planning. Well, what times do I need to hit um, in training? How can I improve each day to really kind of be the better best version of myself I can be? And that's kind of where it started and um, continually kind of improving uh, from there and improving um, hopefully closer to that that goal. And I guess if I don't feel I'm getting close to that goal with what I'm doing, um, it's really about um, working out well, what can I change to really kind of benefit um, myself um, in the short term, but also benefit myself in the long term. Um, so yeah, it's just really about a mindset change, I think. And um, yeah, we've changed, I guess, circumstances. Uh, um, lives have kind of been turned upside down by this COVID thing. But um, yeah, that doesn't mean your goal can change. It just means that the way you're going to get there might be different. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I've got a question in regards to the full-time job that you hold as well as being a Paralympian. If you were just a Paralympian, would you make enough money to live off or is it? <laughs> no, um, don't make any money off being a Paralympian. It's more, I guess, the passion for doing what what I do. And I kind of, I guess, for me, um, it's always been about how far I can kind of push myself. Um, and I guess, yeah, it's great So I guess um, be um known for what I do but um yeah definitely not not something to live off um uh um anytime any well in the four games that I've been to and and I'm, uh, currently it's definitely not <laughs> not not enough to to live off um and um yeah it's just more about I guess my uh, trying to see how far I can push myself and see what I can kind of do so I've got a question from um a Nora have you faced issue with the licensing, especially in sport? Um, so following on from the classification for when uh, the sport uh, is blind? Um, I guess, yeah, it's um, probably always an individual issue with uh, how they classify. I think it's it's a very complicated process uh, from a, both from a vision perspective and um for me, I'm in the physical classification um, because of my cerebral palsy, but um, yeah, they're both, uh, the classification process for sport in Australia and internationally is very complex. Um, and there's, I guess, a lot of details and intricate stuff that goes into classification. And uh, yeah, it's it's very uh, scientific and very, uh, um, yeah, it's 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 a very complicated process. <laughs> so, keeping on the subject of your sport, um, Matt, you've won an Order of Australia medal for services to sport. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so it was for my uh, services to sport um, for winning gold in London, twenty twelve. Uh, so yeah, it was it's great to be, I guess, recognised for what I do um, in in my sport and. Yeah, it was it was it was um, a great moment and something that I'm really proud of and something that I guess uh, um, yeah is just top of um, my uh, achievement list um, in terms of that it's known I guess nationwide or worldwide. Uh, I guess people can forget your medals and all the accolades you win, but um, I guess having an Order of Australia I guess is pretty pretty cool and something pretty special that. Um, that I hold hold close to my heart. With your uh, with your medals, um, rifle off for people that don't know. What medals have you won, and where do you keep them? <laughs> uh, I keep them in a drawer, uh, and the medals I've won, I guess, over the past four Paralympic Games, uh, I've won uh, two gold, one silver, four bronze. Um, and then uh, a couple of world championship medals as well. Um, I'm not sure the exact number of them. Uh, and then one Commonwealth Games uh, gold medal on the Gold Coast uh, in 2018. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, I've had a, I guess a pretty good, pretty good career. Um, but um, yeah, it's all been through I guess hard work and uh, and um, yeah, just um, making sure I train hard and and keep keep on keeping at it. 
Yeah, no dramas. Well, we're wanting to know, Haiti is asking, I was wondering if you've needed any accommodations in your workplace or whilst training for the swimming that has been helpful. If so, what have they been and how have you advocated for those needs? Yeah, sure. It's, um, I guess, from a workplace perspective, um, I've got a, a dual screen, um, enlarged uh, technology on my laptop. Uh, I guess I've been working from home for a year and a bit now. Um, so, yeah, and um, obviously ergonomical uh, chair as well. Um, but, yeah, it's... Um, I guess the normal kind of uh, uh, accessibility requirements um, that you'd hope for from a, from an organisation. I guess I've kind of got um, nothing. I guess out of the out of the ordinary, and um, yeah, it's um, really about. I guess for me, it's always been about being open and honest with my employer and kind of getting them to understand well, what what do I need and how I can kind of how they can kind of make things better for me uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, well, staying on your job, uh, Matt, you've, you've got quite an extraordinary list of, of backers and support that you've built through your LinkedIn network. Um, I recently discovered the term, you know, finding your people that make, um, that help push you to become the best version of yourself. Um, what is the process for someone who is uh, looking to gain, like what would you suggest people should look for in, uh, in their, their people that, that sort of provide them that support? And you, you've actually been quite successful in, in becoming one of these people for so many names that, that, write, that sort of spoke about your book at the start of your book. So my my two questions are how do you look for people that push you and how do you become somebody that could be of assistance to somebody needing a push? <laughs> uh, I guess I'll ask, answer the first question first. Um, I guess for me, it's always been about finding people that are aligned to, I guess, your values and what you, I guess, your beliefs as well. And for me, I guess it's always been uh, people that, I guess, you want to bring on the journey with you and that I guess understand what you're doing from a personal or professional sense and um, I guess that's those two things are probably the most important and then I guess it's kind of working out well how are they how can they help you on your journey and what can they add add value to what you do um, uh, throughout that and um, yeah I guess I, they're kind of the key things that I kind of look for when I'm kind of looking for people that can help me and um, I guess it's not it's also being not scared to uh, take criticism and take um, take feedback on board as well um, I think the best people that I've been able to surround myself with have been people that have been able to tell me what I don't want to hear and being able to I guess steer me in that direction that have been able to push me further than I think I could um, and I guess similarly to uh, being one of those people, I guess it's, I guess it's not something that kind of, uh, I guess a job you apply for or anything. It's just really something that happens, I guess. Um, some people are, I guess, naturals at, um, at that kind of mentorship. And um, I guess it's really about finding people that you're comfortable with and comfortable with sharing uh your goals and and aspirations and that kind of thing and uh yeah it's just um i guess uh forms naturally i guess uh in in in, in that process of uh when you're kind of looking for people to talk to well answered uh we have a question from andrew who's asking do you utilize the ndis uh no i i, I don't um, at this point in time. Okay. Question from the Moy. Was there a point in your journey when you thought of giving up? How did you push past that to become who you are today? Okay. Um, yeah, I guess there's always been points in my, my life where I've kind of wanted to give up or stop or think it's too hard. And, uh, for me, I guess it's always remembering that, uh, we have limited opportunities in life to, 
uh, do something. Um, uh, I guess an example that I can kind of think of is um, uh, many winters morning when I don't want to get out of bed and go to training. Um, I always kind of think back why I started and why I wanted to do it in the first place. Um, and that kind of gets me motivated and gets me my brain to understand that um, we're bigger than what we think we are. And um, it's really about, I guess, uh, processing that opportunity to the best of its ability. And I think you can put that into anything in life. Uh, it's really about um, thinking if I guess you don't want to do something or if something looks like it's too hard, it's really about, I guess, going back to why I wanted to do that in the first place and really kind of having that conversation with yourself and uh, and really, I guess, getting that clarity that, yes, I still want to do this, um, which is a tick. Um, and then if you still want to do it, then it's really about working out well, why, uh, how I can kind of make this situation better than than I than it is at the moment, and uh, yeah, it's really about I guess having that conversation with yourself to get the best out of um, that situation and, and that uh, route that I guess you're in. Because um, once that moment's passed, that that moment's gone forever. So it's really about making that most of the opportunities we have, um, whatever that is, um, and um, really kind of seeing if you can kind of make the most of that and uh when I have I guess a bad day at training I kind of always look at one thing um or two things that I can kind of do well and do the best of my ability in that particular session um and we can still we can do that in, in anything we do in life um whether it's turning up for work or or just getting out of bed it's just really about doing that one or two things um really well um and then that I guess is enough to change our mindset to really kind of make us feel a lot better about what we're doing. So we've got a couple of questions around how you started off um, in swimming and going through the classification. Were you guided into the swimming sports or did you just decide that you had an affinity for it? Um, I guess, like? yeah, um, I started swimming for health reasons and uh, therapy. Um, so that's just how I started. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, it was just started probably um, mainly for health health reasons and, and still is for health reasons. But um, and then I kind of went from there and kind of got a bit better and trained a bit more. And uh, yeah, it just kind of went from there. And um, Sydney 2000 had the Paralympics and Olympic Games. And that's, I guess, kind of where I saw people with far worse disabilities than myself. And that's, I guess, where I got the uh, the drive to really kind of push further and 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 uh, get um, that I guess motivation to um, swim at a higher level than I was was at that stage and uh, yeah it just I guess happened naturally and um, I guess I really like loved racing and uh, yeah it just went from there. So what I'm getting is you haven't always loved sport but once you yeah. once you got the itch you, you couldn't stop scratching it I suppose <laughs> uh yeah something like that uh and yeah I guess I kind of uh well obviously I like love the racing um I love the the friendships you make and the experiences you can gain from it uh so there's a lot I guess a lot of stuff other than just the the training that you can in, enjoy um it's just a matter of I guess um finding what you enjoy out of it to make the most of it. So the, the question I've got is relating to uh, finding your way in the business world. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what, what was, what would, what advice would you give a young 16 year old Matt Levy about career and how to, how to navigate into a full-time employment? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Cause I was probably, um, yeah, it's really about, I guess, learning uh, and learning, I guess, from those that have been there before. And uh, for me, I guess, I think back at 16, uh, it was, yeah, it wasn't easy. Um, and it's just like really about, I guess, um, doing as much learning and understanding as possible and uh, really finding, I guess, your passion and, and what you really love 
to do. Uh, and um, I guess once you kind of do that, it's really about, I guess, showing what you can do, not what you can't do. Um, I guess when I got my first job, it was, um, yeah, I didn't know anything from, from a bar of soap, but it was really about, I guess, working out what I could do um, and doing that to the best of my ability and doing that really well. Um, and then kind of moving and learning that next thing and that next thing and the next thing until you kind of create a suite of really good skills, uh, whether they're soft or hard skills um, that would um, help you progress to your next career move and, and, and the like. And um, for me, I guess I've tried to do that throughout my career um, uh, from the very start. Um, I guess I didn't get into uni or anything. Um, I didn't get a really good HSC uh, grade. Um, so I, I got a, I did a diploma that next year um, and um, I got into uni that way. Um, and yeah, just kind of went from there. And um, once you kind of learn one thing, um, it goes into the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But um, I guess one thing that I have learned is not to get disheartened by failure and not to get disheartened by knockbacks because you'll get many knockbacks um, in, in life and uh, in business, but it's just really about remaining positive and uh, continuing to, to learn and, and upskill yourself um, to the best of your ability. Cause um, yeah, one day you'll um, be speaking to someone or a job will come up and you'll, you'll just nail it. And um, I guess nail that interview the first time. So it's, yeah, for me, I guess one message I could leave you is to yeah not get despondent with what you do um, and just continue to be positive uh, in that experience. Now, we've got a question regarding what was your first job? Um, so my first job was working at reception at House No Steps. So it's a disability employment uh, agency in Belrose. Um, so I was there for about two, uh, two and a bit years. Um, so that was, I guess, my first real job. And I guess I kind of learned from that uh, a lot of uh, skills around etiquette, uh, skills around phone etiquette, um, presentation skills, uh, like the really soft skills that I guess is not taught that much these days. Um, but um, yeah, that was, I guess, my first uh, opportunity into the corporate or business world. I what I what I find interesting, um, well, one of the many things I found interesting in your book. So, it seems like you've used your soft skills regarding mm -hmm. communication uh, in every facet of your life, but that wasn't uh, you had you had to learn how to communicate, um, and it was it wasn't an easy road for you to take by any stretch. Yeah, so I guess yeah, it's it hasn't been easy, and yeah, communication is very pivotal in how we do it because people need to understand what you're talking about and how you articulate stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, I guess I uh, had slurred speech and and that kind of stuff in my early years. Um, so I guess communicating took a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of continuing to work on work on things that you're weak at um, and uh, eventually they'll become your strengths and then you work on your next weakness and your next weakness. But um, yeah, it's just really about uh, honing in on those, those skills. So we've got, uh, we've got a question from Ruby and it kind of aligns with, uh, I suppose, now that you're on your way to Tokyo at the end of August, what is next for Matthew Levy? Where do you uh, where do you head from here? What's your next goal? Do you have any other passions other than sport? Uh, I guess I've um, yeah. I guess Paralympics is the next port of call, and then um, next year we have Commonwealth Games uh, in uh, Birmingham. Um, so that's I guess my next big goal from a swimming perspective, um, and then we'll kind of see what happens. From, from there and uh, I might be uh, I think you're writing a, a children's version of my book um, so a bit more uh, not as heavy um, so I'll be 273 pages uh, but um, yes yeah, so I'm kind of working on that at the moment um, and uh, yeah seeing where that kind of kind of lands because um, um, yeah kind of when I was re writing my um, keeping my head above water book uh, I kind of realized that 
um, it's going to hit only a certain percentage of the audience. Um, and I guess what I really want to hit is, I guess, uh, that younger audience and really kind of get them to understand uh, that, um, yeah, life can be hard, but it's really about, I guess, um, continuing to grow and continue to learn. And uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of where that concept came from. And um, yeah, apart from my, my day job, uh, uh, that's, I guess, what really keeps me busy. <laughs> Uh, we've got a question from Gemma, just in regards to how the delay in the Tokyo Paralympics has affected your training. Yeah, so we had about two, three months off during the big lockdown uh, last March, April. Um, but, um, yeah, I guess it took a bit of a hit from a physical perspective and, and from a mental perspective. But um, once we knew the Games was going to go ahead, um, it was really about, I guess, refocusing and, and re-energising and kind of... Uh, Re, re, reassessing, I guess, where we wanted to go and how we wanted to do it. Um, Cause um, yeah, it was another year down the track uh, than we anticipated. Uh, so it was yeah, really about really kind of getting ahead back in the game and um, really kind of focusing from a mental and mindset perspective than anything else. So I've got a question from Ruby asking, what's the hardest part of your job? Um, I guess the hardest part of my job would be uh, dealing with people that uh, that uh, are difficult stakeholders that uh, um, don't understand, I guess, what what we do. Um, I mean, change management at, at work, and um, sometimes you have to have those difficult conversations with stakeholders uh, that don't want, don't like the particular project or change that you're trying to deliver. So it's um yeah, the hardest part of the job would be um, trying to convince other people that it's a good thing when they don't think it's a good thing. Um, and that's, I guess, really kind of getting them to understand the facts um, and I guess the process behind what that particular change is. Understandable. I imagine a lot of people going through change at the present moment, uh, <laughs> you're promoting more change and uh, that would be, uh, I know we've all sort of worked with people that would dig their mm -hmm. heels in and panic at the word change. Yeah, I, I'd imagine so, but yeah, um, yeah, I guess it's just really about um, selling it to them in a way that they're comfortable with um, and, uh, yeah, working it out individually with them to really kind of get the best outcome for both um, is that kind of how I kind of see it. <laughs> um, I'm interested in relaying um, your your feelings towards um, a, a, a win and a fail towards your goals you have a rather um, interesting way of, of sort of approaching each experience that you have, whether it be not hitting a goal that you wanted or exceeding in a goal. Um, do you want to give our listeners a bit of an interesting sort of view on that? Yeah, so I guess uh, a difference between a win and a failure, I guess, is uh, for me, I guess, um, it's all a learning learning experience and uh it's all i guess an opportunity to be better than you were yesterday and for me i guess um it's not technically a win or a failure it's really a learning uh and a growth experience and uh whether i guess i win a medal or i don't win a medal at the end of the day it's uh as long as i guess i improve from a I improve from a personal perspective. Um, I guess that's a kind of win in my book. Yes, I guess I kind of do the sport uh, to win medals and, and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you can only control what you do as an individual. Um, you can't control, I guess, what everyone else does. Uh, so I guess when I stand on the blocks representing my country, um, I can't control that person next to me or the person across, uh, across from me. Um, I can only control what I do and how I do it and how I feel. Um, and it's the same, I guess, in anything we do in life, it's really about controlling the controllables. Um, and then I guess hoping that the outcome works in your favor uh, after afterwards. But um, at the end of the day, we can, can we can only control uh, what we do. And it's a matter of continually going through that process um, in our mind to really kind of get the best outcome 
for for us and and for um for what we do because um yeah I guess that's kind of the only thing we can do in life and it's the only thing I guess that uh keeps us sane sometimes so that's a uh, that's a good point I might be providing a bit of a spoiler to your book here but I've had a question <laughs> asked top tips for staying motivated read my book and then you'll find out. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess from staying motivated, I guess from me it's, and from anyone else, it's really about, I guess, trying to continually do what makes you happy and continually do what you're passionate about. Um, I think they're the probably two thing, main things that I, um, can, that I, that helped me stay motivated. Um, and help me, I guess, continually to push those boundaries. And um, I guess as long as I can see improvement and growth in what I do, um, I'll um, continue to do it and continue to stay motivated. But um, as long as I have the passion and the belief and the drive to do it, um, I um, will, yeah, will continue to continue to do it. And that's, I guess, what keeps me keeps me motivated. So you're uh, you're an, an athlete on a a diet, I imagine, a strict diet. Worst yeah. food you have to eat. Um, I just make sure I just keep uh, monitoring what I eat. Um, make sure I don't have too much chocolate cake or Easter eggs or that kind of thing. Um, there's not uh, too much of a strict strict diet involved. It's just more about um watching my portion size and quantity size and and that kind of thing to really kind of uh not overeat or undereat. Um, and just eat enough for that training session that I'll have the next day or the uh, um, or the day after that and kind of making sure I'm continuing to refuel uh, when I uh, post training and after training sessions. So if you win gold in Tokyo, what's going to be the meal of choice afterwards to celebrate? Well, considering we're in Tokyo and still in COVID, they'll probably give us a frozen meal to put in the microwave. <laughs> I don't think it'll be anything too exciting. And then we have two weeks quarantine. So that's a, that's a celebration. <laughs> so we have a question regarding what does it feel like to win an Olympic medal? Is it pure joy or is it relief? Um, I think it's pure joy like to realise that all that hard work and all that sacrifice has been, been more effort. Um, and you've got, I guess, something to show for it at the end of the day. Um, but um, yeah, I guess this is really about taking not taking it for granted and really kind of um taking a deep breath because um uh you might have another race the next day or a next race in a couple of uh 20 minutes later or whatever um so i guess you can't get too over excited um but it's yeah really about i guess enjoying the moment uh enjoying the experience and soaking it all in i think um is probably the three things that i kind of do so I'm going to say that we've got about 15 minutes um, until the scheduled finish time. So I'm going to say to people that we're getting our last questions in now. Um, for those who uh, need to remember how to ask questions of the webinar, just a quick one, you can email webinar at visionaustralia.org or you could uh, hit Alt-H and put a question in the chat box. Uh Matt, I'm going to go through and ask a couple more questions and then I think we're going to uh, ask the question where people can find your stuff. So sure. I've got a question here from from Ruby asking who your favourite Paralympian is that you have met. Uh, well, met a few, but I think um, Kurt Fernley springs to mind, just um, I guess the stuff that he's done outside of his sport. Uh, I guess he's a big advocate for um disabilities uh and I th he's walked Kokoda on his hands um so I think it's some of the stuff that he's kind of done um sticks to mind but um yeah I think all of us Paralympians are someone to look up to um but um yeah it's uh been inspiring I guess to watch some of the people and what they do in different sports and in my own sport uh because yeah there's some pretty inspirational people out there Final questions, guys. Anyone got any more final questions? I might ask. Uh, I remember Ian Thorpe at the Sydney 2000 Olympics um, 
setting a trend with the full body swimsuit. Is there ever a trend that you thought you might have, that you wish you would have started? Uh, not that I can think of. I don't think um, swimming with a beard will be a trend. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when I do. <laughs> no problems. All right. So what I might do at this point, because I know that you're a, a very busy man and you're off to another meeting straight after this. So I want to, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for your time uh, to wish you well in Tokyo. And uh, I'm sure everyone will be watching and listening. Uh, hopefully uh, hoping that you bring home gold. Uh, where can people find your book uh, other than the Vision Australia Library, which I've already touched on is heading, is on its way? Yeah, so there's hard copies available on my website, um, mattlevyoam.com.au. Um, so there's a, a, a shop on there that you can purchase um, using using uh, whatever means you, you would like um, to purchase a hard copy there. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm happy to sign hard copies um, if you if you guys would like. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, I guess that's where that's the easiest place to find um, find the book. Um, and, uh, yeah, happy to, um, uh, answer any questions. Um, uh, Jordan, if there's any post this, uh, webinar as well. Happy to send those through for those who use LinkedIn as well. I'd encourage you to, uh, to connect up with Matt on LinkedIn. He always sends inspirational quotes and they always give me a bit of a buzz. So, uh, I'd encourage you to do the same. Uh, Matthew Levy, thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me and have a great uh, Monday. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.